I am a um, <clears throat> trainer for Sozo. Sozo is an inner healing deliverance ministry, and I travel all over training people in the ministry. And one of our core values uh, is that we, as practitioners of this inner healing ministry, Sozo, S O Z O, <clears throat> it's a Greek word that means full meal deal. Comes with fries and a Coke. And um, for far too long, the church has focused on salvation that we've missed the kingdom. Uh, and it's caused the church to become an organization rather than an organism. But Jesus didn't die to get you to heaven. He died to get heaven to earth. Think about it. If Jesus died to get you to heaven, the most merciful thing he could have done as soon as you were saved was kill you. Amen. Take you out. Amen. Maybe, maybe you experienced this after you got saved. Now, there's always a honeymoon. It's, uh, I remember when <clears throat> one particular uh, drug addict that could barely put two sentences together, two words together, and he was suffering from paranoia big time, got saved, and we started leading him through the word. And as he read the word, God completely cleansed him, transformed him, and ended up, it's interesting, a drug addict that was probably stealing from everybody he could for his habit ended up being the head of security for one of, for one of the largest churches in the Metroplex. <laughs> I just thought that was hilarious. I just love the way God does it. But... Um, the, this sozo is, the word actually means, uh, oh, I was talking about the honeymoon, and I remember he, he would come in and say, Pastor, God is so good. I, was, I went to the store the other day, and I asked him to give me a front parking space, and he did. And then one time he said, you know, Pastor, I was changing the oil on my car, and <clears throat> he said, I, I didn't have the tool to take the filter off. And I just said, in Jesus' name, come off. And I reached up and turned it. And, it, and I was able to pull it off with my hand. Isn't God good? And I said, yes, he is. How many of you have grown to a place where God no longer takes off your oil filters or gives you front parking spaces? <laughs> the, the, there is a period of time because there's something that happens in this thing that we call the Christian walk. And by the way, Christian... Uh, the word means anointed ones. It's, it's not a sect of a religion. Uh, you're anointed ones. And uh, this Christian walk, God, have you noticed how God comes close? And it's like he's tangible and he's palpable. And it, you, like right now, <laughs> I can't, you, you just can't move without sensing and feeling him. And maybe you even move into a place, I, I've smelled him before. It's a glorious aroma. And, and I think, you know, Scripture says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I believe that there's even a flavor of God. And, uh, um, and it's just, it's like he's right there with you. And, and, it's, and it's like in that time he's revealing things in the word and he's revealing things about life. And then you start walking that out and it's like he steps back. Did you know that's actually his way of coming close and moving back? Coming close and moving back. And if, if it was all about salvation, then... <clears throat> the best thing he could do is save you and take you out. But it's not about salvation. Just about salvation. Sozo is about salvation, healing, and deliverance. And the purpose of that is to prepare you to bring heaven to earth. That's actually our, our modus operandi. That's what we're here for. And uh, I just finished a Sozo training yesterday in, in Cedar Hill at Trinity Church in Cedar Hill. And so <clears throat> if I'm, I sound a little quiet, my voice is a little bit stressed, and I have a stool up here because I'm getting a new hip this year, but I haven't got it yet, and sometimes I have to, to rest it. It's the reason I sat down during the worship. Uh, hopefully that didn't offend anyone. If it did, you'll just have to get over it. But the reason I bring, the reason I bring Sozo up 
is because one of our core values in Sozo is if you come in as a, as a client, and don't let that offend you either, but again, if it does, that's your problem, not mine. <clears throat> when they come and sit in my office and we work the tools, ministry of inner healing and deliverance, one of our core values is we only do what God and the client want to do. And I have uh, no problem in that. In fact, when I'm training, if you were to come to my training, I, I beat that drum loudly and long. Why? Because the, the, the primary directive of Sozo is to get people connected with God. <coughs> because I don't want them calling me for the answers as a pastor because I don't have the answers. Can we just pause for a moment and think about this? We all have problems, right? How many in the room have never experienced a problem? I don't see any hand. I saw an elbow go up, but I think he's scratching the back of his neck, so, so I'm okay with that. Uh, the, the bottom line is we all have problems, right? We're individuals, right? Did you know our problems many times are individuals as well? And so there's no blanket answers other than this, God. So we want to get people connected to God. And I'll beat that drum because I don't want people giving people answers for their inner healing and deliverance. I want to connect them to God because God gives them the answers. Because I've got news for you. As soon as they leave my office, there's an enemy that's going to come and try to steal. Wow. It's going to try to steal going to try to steal <laughs> it's going to try to steal from them what they just got and I want them to be able to connect up with the Godhead and get the answer they need to keep him from stealing <clears throat> and I have no problem in, in a sozo I'm prophetic I can get prophetic words I get prophetic visions uh, I have thoughts that I know are from God but I don't share them with them because I want them to get them directly from God. And it's amazing how he says what I am sensing. You can turn this down. I'll, I'll kind of raise my voice too. You can, I can actually hear what the solution is. And when I have them ask God, they hear the same thing I heard. It's, it's really cool. So I am totally disciplined with that. <coughs> and I... I never counsel in a sozo, and I never give them anything from my heart or my thoughts. And I have no problem doing that. One day, a few weeks ago, the Lord came to me and said, Randy, you know how you do that in sozo? How come you can't operate that same self-control in the culture right now? Where you're only saying what I'm saying. I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but our culture right now is in chaos. Has anybody noticed that? Maybe it's not happening in your part of the world, but uh, i got news for you. Right now, our, uh, yeah, the, this young lady right here, tell me your name again. Rachel. Rachel. We've met before, Rachel. By the way, I love your shirt. <clears throat> You said it's really dark in the world right now, and it's getting darker. Not by the plan of God, it's not, but because the sons of God are not arising and shining. <laughs> so the Lord asked me, Randy, why is it that you think your opinion is going to change the culture? <clears throat> Why do you think you sharing your opinion is going to change the hearts of men for good? Because, Randy, armpit, uh, air, uh, opinions are like armpits. Everybody has two. Usually they both stink. Now, I don't know if the Lord ever talks to you about this kind of stuff, but... I began to take a personal inventory. 
And I, I began to back up. Now, I spend a lot of time in study of the Word. But if I'm not studying the Word, I actually have a choice to what, of what to consume. It's interesting that uh, what, consume, what you consume eventually will consume you. My daughter bought me a sign. Ashley bought me a sign here a while back. It says, you are what you eat. Funny, I don't remember eating the legend. Some of y'all will get that about Wednesday. <laughs> you are what you eat. And what you consume eventually will consume you. So let's take an let's take a s inventory of our soul. What are the thoughts that have been consuming your mind? What are the things that have been consuming your time? Or are you faith-filled and hopeful? Or are you frustrated and doubt-filled about the future? What you consume will consume you. So are you consuming a lot of social media? Well, social media will eventually consume you to where that's the only thing that you talk about, think about, live in. Are you consuming a lot of news? And I don't care what channel you consume. What you consume will eventually consume you. <clears throat> I've lived 61 years. I'm hoping to live another 60 years. 120 is what was promised of the Lord. And so I'm, I'm working towards that. The point is, in 61 years, I've never really seen a cultural solution come out of Washington, D.C. In 61 years, I have never seen a solution come from the news media. I would challenge you to think... Have you? And yet, our culture right now is being consumed by the very thing they're consuming. <clears throat> so the Lord was challenging my self-control and reminding me of this verse, Proverb twenty-five twenty-eight. You might want to write that down and go look at it. It says this, like a city that is broken into and without walls is the man who does not have control over his own soul. Like a city that is broken into and without walls is the man who has no control over his own spirit. The word spirit there, but it actually is not the spirit that, that man carries. It's actually his soul. His mind, his will, his emotions, his choices, his thoughts. If you don't have control over that, then you are a city that has no protection. And the enemy can come in and break in and kill, steal, and destroy. <clears throat> if you don't have control over your own thoughts, if you don't have control over your own soul, you actually open the door to the enemy and say, come in and do whatever you want to do. I think I, when I was here last time, I talked to you a little bit about the devil can't steal anything from you. When Jesus was about to go back to heaven, he's about to ascend to heaven, he had his uh, disciples and a few other, a, hundred, <clears throat> a few people up on the mountainside. About 500 is what Scripture says. And he sits up there and he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now you go. Did I tell you all this last time I was here? Somebody give me a set of keys. Let me borrow a set of keys. <clears throat> What's your car? Where is it? It's a BMW. It's a BM it only has two wheels. Oh, the motorcycle. Well, I won't steal that one. 
So Jesus is on the Mount of Ascension, and he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. That's what keys represent. They represent authority that you have to open certain doors. And he said, I have all the keys to all the doors, all the solutions. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now you go. And then he took these keys that Satan didn't steal from Adam and Eve, but Adam and Eve gave them to him in the garden, right? That's right. He didn't come up and sneak up and pickpocket at him. He walked right up to him and said, those are mine now. Because you are choosing the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that's my tree. And since you're choosing knowledge over relationship, I get the keys to, your, to the kingdom of God that God delegated to you. And then Jesus went to hell after he was crucified. And he went, walked into hell because he had paid the price of redemption. He walked towards the gates of hell. And like the doors of Target, they just opened to him. Because inanimate objects recognize the, the power and the authority of Christ before animate objects do. And he just walked in, and in spite of what Carmen tried to tell us in his song, there was never a battle between Jesus and Satan. There was no wrestling match. And there was no struggle, even on the cross. There was no battle. There never has been a battle between Satan and God. Amen. Because if there ever was, and there will be one day, it's in the scripture. There's going to be a battle, and it's over before the word can be spelled. It's done. And so Jesus goes to hell, and he walks up to Satan, and he does this. And Satan has to sheepishly go. No struggle. And then Jesus says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Now you, man, go. And he restored that authority. And he didn't restore it to Christians. He restored it to man. In other words, now we're back on plan A. Because Father God has no plan B. It's Genesis 1.28. Be fruitful and multiply. Replenish the earth. And take dominion of everything. That's what Jesus was reiterating on the Mount of Ascension. We're back to plan A, guys. Bring heaven to earth. Disciple every ethnic group. <clears throat> and that authority cannot be stolen from the believer. Cannot be stolen from the unbeliever. It has to be relinquished through agreement. You see, our enemy is a legalist. He's a legalist. He looks at everything legally because he knows he can't infiltrate the hearts and minds of believers unless there is an agreement and a door is open to him. One of those doors is the door of fear. And when we live our lives in fear, we are blowing the door off the hinges and saying, All hell, come. You're welcome here. We're partners now. Come and wreak havoc in our lives. We can't wait to have you at our table. That's what that means when, when I choose fear. But 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, you need to know this, people. Papa God, I, Father God, will never give you a spirit of fear. But I will give you the spirit of revelation light to walk in power and love and self-control. In other words, if I'm partnering with fear, I'm not partnering with the Spirit of God. Anybody seen any fear lately? So what's the solution? Is the solution beating people up and saying, don't you dare wear a mask. You just, you know what? If you wear a mask, you are partnering with the enemy, and the enemy is the party that I don't believe I like very much. 
Don't you dare do this. Don't. You know what? As a, as a Christian, I got a, uh, somebody sent this to me because I'm not going to wear a mask. I, I'm not going to wear one. And, and the reason I'm not going to wear one is because if God can't protect me, I can't be protected. No matter how much fabric I put over my face. And, and I'm just, I feel like the Holy Spirit has said to me, son, I don't want you wearing a mask. I want you to make a different statement. And so I, I had someone send me, it, and, and I've not been quiet about that. If you want to wear a mask, I'm fine with that. As long as Holy Spirit has told you to wear a mask. And, and, and so I get a video from this guy, uh, not from him, but somebody sent it to me because they heard me blow off. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and it's him talking about how love would wear a mask. Okay, now that's okay for him. But it's, he doesn't need to beat me up because I believe I'm doing what the Holy Spirit told me to do. And he can do what the Holy Spirit tells him to do. And I need to be okay with that too. So evidently the solution isn't preaching and beating people up with my particular definition of what God has said. <laughs> I think the answer is in Genesis 1, 1 and 2. You might want to write that down. Maybe you know it real well. I want to read it from the Passion Translation. When God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was completely formless and empty. Everybody say formless and empty. Could I just give you a definition of that word? This, the, I think this is funny. I just think this is hilarious. Formless, the word in Hebrew means formlessness, confusion, unreality, emptiness, meaningless arguments. The word void means meaningless, emptiness. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was completely full of meaningless arguments. Does that sound familiar? Meaningless arguments, because we're not getting solutions we're just getting more arguments. And, and so what's the answer? Get a better argument. I just need more statistics. I, I was, <laughs> every once in a while, someone will send me something. And, and, um, and because I'm, right now I'm fasting social media. I'm fasting news. I'm fasting politics. Um. Because what you consume will eventually consume you. And I started finding it real hard to get up and preach the word and not politics. I found it really difficult to preach with, without, you know, kind of sneaking it in here and there. And sneaking it in here and there. You know, and trying to keep a loving pastor face on. while trying to espouse my particular political position. Until I had someone who loves me say to me one time, and this has been in the last five weeks, that I had said something on Sunday morning in jest, but really didn't feel like it was in jest. That said, if people weren't voting the way that I voted, they were not listening to the Holy Spirit. Now, that's a judgment. Based on an opinion. Not based on the Word of God. And I'm not just talking about the written Word. I'm talking about what He is saying. Which is the key to this verse. And I think this is the key to the solution of our cultural problems right now. Because I do believe, Rachel, that things are dark.
but I don't believe they have to get darker. You see, I don't hold to the old theological uh, uh, position of the church for years that as time goes on, it's going to get darker and darker. Well, then the scripture isn't true because the scripture says of the increase of his kingdom and his peace, there will be no end. And there's no way that light can increase and darkness can increase at the same time. Something's got to give. And darkness never dispels light. Now, I, I, I think what you're saying, and I'm, please don't get me wrong, Rachel, because what you said, it, dark times are here. <clears throat> Isaiah said it like this. Dark times are over the world and over the people. But the Lord, let me, let me start with the first verse. Arise and shine. For your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Behold, darkness will cover the earth, and great darkness the people. But the Lord will arise upon you, and the kings will come to the brightness of your rising. Everybody say rising. It doesn't say come to the brightness of the light you believe. It doesn't say, come to the brightness of light. It says, they will come to the brightness of your rising. So arise and shine. Well, okay, but I thought that's what I was doing. Well, here's the test. Darkness was draped over the deep, this formless and empty deep. And this darkness that was draped over it, I, I love um, Brian Simmons. He's, he's translating the full Bible. He's gotten the New Testament done. He's actually done Genesis now. I don't, did we put those out? We have a few of those. Yeah. If you want to pick one of those up this morning, we have some. Because I want to get it out to everybody that wants it. You can also get it online. But he's in this Genesis. He says this darkness that was draped over the deep wasn't just an absence of light but it was actually a spirit. <clears throat> and, and it says that this spirit of darkness is covering and causing chaos. But listen to this. God's spirit hovered. And when I say hovered, I want everybody to do this. God's spirit hovered over the face of the waters. Why am I having you do this? Because the definition of that word is the picture of a, a mother hen fanning the, the nest so that the eggs get circulation so they can burst into their destiny. Uh, another definition of the word is uh, best to understand when it says, and the Spirit hovered over Mary and she conceived Jesus, the Messiah. So this, this is a Holy Spirit hovering and, and it literally means to move back and forth gently. In an intimate moment. And the Holy Spirit is hovering, brooding over the chaos. And the Holy Spirit is waiting for something. Do you know what he's waiting for? Anybody? He's waiting for a word. He's waiting for a word. Listen to this. And the Holy Spirit hovered over the face of the waters. And then God said, let there be light. And light burst forth. And God saw the light as pleasing and beautiful. He used the light to dispel darkness. God called the de light day and the darkness night. And so evening gave way to morning the first day. Everybody say evening gave way to morning the first day. First day ended, second day began. Now, <clears throat> this formlessness, this emptiness was no challenge for God. This chaos <laughs> was no challenge for God. All he needed was for Holy Spirit to brood over it and speak into it the opposite of what was there. <laughs> Did you hear that? All he needed was to speak a word 
He tells us in the book of Isaiah, through the prophet Isaiah, that my word is like the rain from heaven. It falls down and waters the earth, and it doesn't return to me until it's accomplished what I've sent it to do. The same thing with my word. When I speak a word, that word will not return to me empty and void. That word will not produce chaos that comes back up into my face. That word will accomplish what I sent it to do. And Holy Spirit was brooding, waiting for a world. And when he spoke, a hundred billion galaxies were born. In the vapor of his breath, the planets formed. He spoke a word. And a hundred billion creatures catch his breath in a word. God began to bring order the moment he spoke a word. And the Holy Spirit hovering, this is, this is an intimate moment between Father and Holy Spirit that produced creation. And I got news for you. Holy Spirit is hovering over chaos right now. And he's waiting for one thing. A word. And it isn't vote Republican. It isn't vote Democrat. It isn't social media posts with memes that put down the ones that are our supposed enemy. We have an enemy. I, I'm not saying we don't have an enemy. We do. But we have no weapons for fighting flesh and blood enemies. But we do have weapons of warfare, and they're mighty to pull down strongholds, to set order in chaos. But they're not flesh and blood weapons because we don't have a flesh and blood enemy. Oh, wait a minute. What about them jihadist Muslims? You want to know what's happening to our enemy in Iran? They're being saved by the thousands. By the thousands. Go check out a YouTube video. If you've got to get on the Internet, go watch something that will bring you life. It's called Asleep Among, uh, excuse me, As Sheep Among Wolves. <coughs> This, this video, it's uh, two videos, uh, each two hours long, and the first talks about the revival in Iran. And what's happening is, no longer is Jesus having to show up to the Muslims because he's gotten enough of them saved that they're showing up for the Muslims. And they're putting their life on the line, and many of them are being martyred to preach the gospel of the kingdom. And these Muslims are coming to Jesus in droves. And you know who the primary leaders are? The women. In the second video, and by the way, they're under such bondage. The women have to wear burqas. They can't drive. They can't leave the house without permission from their husbands. Now, the challenge for many of them is their husbands are in Europe trying to make a living because there is no living to be made in Iran. The economy is wrecked. They're under the worst oppression that women have ever been under, and yet, they're choosing to stay there in the oppression. I know this. In, in this video, there's this one couple that immigrated to, to the U.S. And they were here for a little while, and the wife went to her husband and said, Honey, I want to move back to Iran. And he said, you've, you've got to be out of your mind. Why would we do that? Here you're free. You don't have to wear the burqa. You can drive. Why would you want to do that? She said, Because there is a satanic lullaby lulling the church to sleep in America. And I would rather be under the bondage of Iran, living in the freedom with my lover and master Jesus, than to be lulled to sleep and not have that intimacy. You see, part of our problem as a church is we think that order is the way we think it should be. I think it should be as God says it should be. Uh, by the way, has God ever done anything that made you uncomfortable? 
I, I think of Joseph. Uh, Joseph is a great example because God gave him a promise that his family was going to bow down to him. Now, Josh, uh, Joseph, I don't know if he was just stupid. He shared that vision with his family. And his brothers, who weren't holy and righteous men, dreamers, they were going to kill him. But thank God for the one who wanted to make a buck. So let's not kill him. Let's make some money off of this jerk. So they sold him into slavery. And then from slavery, he, it's interesting, too, that it was Ishmaelites that carried him into slavery. And, and sells, sell him into slavery to be resold into slavery. He ends up in Potiphar's house. And he starts serving, serving righteously, serving a godless master, serving one that had him in slavery. And he served him so well that he got promoted to be over everything in Potiphar's realm except for his wife, which makes sense. And his wife wanted something different. Y'all know the story, right? And so Potiphar's wife tries to get Joseph in bed and Joseph says, I wouldn't do that to my master. Now think just a moment what the heart is in this young man. Now, she might have been ugly as a mud fence, but the point is not whether she was desirous or not. I mean, that would be a lot easier to be righteous, wouldn't it, men? I mean, she's ugly as a mud fence. <laughs> Chances are she wasn't. And he's a slave. The truth is, he's going against his master. He's a slave. But his heart is, I would never do that to Potiphar. He is my master. You see, this guy has a heart of service that, that goes beyond the pale. And then this master that he so honored has him thrown in prison to save face. Because Potiphar's wife accuses him of, of trying to assault her. Because he runs out in such a hurry, he leaves his coat. And she uses that as evidence against him. And Potiphar knows, he knows, the scripture, the way you read it in scripture, you know he knows his wife is lying. Why? Because he knows Joseph's heart. He knows how he has served him. He puts him in prison. Prison, you know what happens. He, he interprets dreams for these two people. One was the wine bearer. The other was the, the, the baker. And one, he says, this dream means you're going to die. Your dream means you're going to be restored to the Pharaoh. And when you are, remember me. It's two years later. After the guy's restored to Pharaoh's court. Two years. Finally, Pharaoh has a dream. And nobody can, none of his diviners, none of his inspired men can uh, translate it. And, and the wine bearer is sitting there and Pharaoh's complaining because he doesn't have anybody to interpret this dream. And, you know, the wine, all of a sudden, oh, 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 there's a guy in your prisons who can do this. He can interpret the dream. And Pharaoh brings him in, and you know the rest of the story. But you know how much time it was between he, when he shared the dream with his family and when he was put in a place for his brothers and family to bow down to him? About 17 years. About 17 years. Joseph never complained. He just continued to be who God said he was doing what God told him to do. I want you to look at one other verse in Genesis. Genesis 2. They said I could go to 3 o'clock, so y'all just settle in. <clears throat> Genesis 2.4 says, At the time Yahweh God created the earth and heaven, there was yet no vegetation, grains of the field, or shrubs sprouting on the earth. For there, And here's the reason. For there was no one to cultivate the land. It says, and Yahweh God had not yet sent the rain. But that wasn't the reason nothing was there. Because in those days a mist arose from the soil and watered the whole face of the ground. And by the way, 
It continued to be that way after creation. It did not rain until the flood with Noah. So the, the reason there weren't grains or shrubs or plants wasn't because there was no rain. It was because there was no one there to cultivate the land. No one there to steward God's plan. No one there to steward God's plan A. So, Yahweh, God scooped up a lump of soil, sculpted a man, and blew into his nostrils the breath of life. Then man came alive, a living soul. And God planted a garden in the east of Eden. And then placed man in that garden to do what? To cultivate and expand that, Genesis 1.28. He put them in this garden, which was just a foothold in the middle of chaos. Can you picture this with me? God takes man, he sculpts him with his own hands and breathes into him his breath. This breath that he said. He breathes into him his breath, which is what it takes to verbalize anything. That breath, which in the vapor of that breath, the planets were formed. And Adam became a living spirit, a living being. And then he took that living being and he carved out in the middle of chaos a foothold and said, now start there and expand it. Take dominion and expand it. And he made Eve, put Adam and Eve there. And he said, now make a lot of babies. Have a lot of sex. Make a lot of babies. And then train those babies in relationship with me so that they expand the garden because we're going to turn this planet back into heaven. Are you with me? <clears throat> so here's a question. What's your view of the chaos today? Are you blaming people who don't hold kingdom values and morals for the chaos which if you are uh, if you're blaming a political party or you're blaming a racial movement or you're blaming someone else uh, what you're saying is they are bigger than God now now I'm not asking anybody to raise their hands this is not a test that we're going to grade you on I just want you to consider what is your view of the chaos today? I just happen to believe the reason chaos is getting a foothold and expanding is because there's no son or daughter of the kingdom that is there to cultivate the light. Now, you see how quiet it got. This is not an accusation. This is an opportunity. <clears throat> it's not merely the absence of a son or a daughter to cultivate it. Because you're a son or a daughter of the kingdom by grace through faith. And aren't we glad? I'm glad. Me and Rachel are glad. And you're Rachel's dad, and Rachel's dad is, I see that hand, is there another? I'm glad it's by grace through faith and not of works. Because there are weeks that my works, pardon me, they just suck. Have you noticed? Sometimes our works just, they're, they're, they're a vacuum. They're not productive. And, and I'm just here to say there's only one way that our works will be productive in shifting the course of this nation and this world back to God. And it's if we're doing what he's doing. Because the Holy Spirit is hovering over this chaos. Why? Because God owns the planet. God owns the planet, and Holy Spirit is hovering, and Holy Spirit is waiting for a word, and God has delegated this planet to man 
So God has already spoken, and now he's waiting for us to speak. The question is, what are you speaking? Is what you're speaking, is what I'm speaking opinion? Now, you know, I'm sharing something that I've walked through, I'm walking through, that God challenged me on. I, I don't know if you ever have preachers come in here and say, I've sinned. I've missed it. But I'm telling you, I've missed it. I, I've gone on a fast of politics because I found that everything was consuming me and turning my heart away from God and onto the political situation. And I don't care what you think about politics. The solution is not in who is our president. The solution is what is the body of Christ doing? Because we are the ruling party of this world. We're the ruling party. And it ain't a party. It's a family. And the question is, what are we going to do? Are we going to blame the people? Are, are we going to blame Hollywood for this chaos? Oh, well, they've been producing all this horrible stuff. I just wonder if we quit damning the darkness and started releasing the light of their prophetic destiny, what kind of movies would Hollywood produce? If we began to call them into their destiny. I, I wonder what would happen in... in uh, Las Vegas. If instead of damning the darkness there, we were to release the light of their destiny because they have a specific destiny. How many of you would say that the casinos are successful? Where is he going with this one? Let's just get honest. How many of you think casinos are financially successful? So they found a secret of reproduction, and it's working. It's a system that is working. I've got news for you. It is a counterfeit of a kingdom truth. Because our enemy cannot create anything. He can only counterfeit the real thing. And we become enamored with the production of the counterfeit sometimes to the place that we miss that it's a counterfeit that produces death in the end instead of releasing the light. What if we were to change what we were saying and actually say what God is saying over those casino owners? You say, well, what in the world could he be saying over that casino owner? I don't know. That's why you've got to get with him. Is, any, is anybody ready for me to wrap up? You're, well, you two are. I'm not, I'm not getting the same feeling from everyone. I, and I really don't care. But, um, <laughs> but it is 12.15. How many of you give me five more minutes? Five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five, thirty, thirty. That's, that's probably enough. <clears throat> are we discouraged by what's happening in the world? If we are, it's because we're focusing on what's happening in the world instead of what's happening in the kingdom. Amen. You see, Jesus, even before he got the physical keys from the enemy, and I think there probably were physical keys, they certainly were spiritual, he looked at his disciples and said, As I give you the keys of the kingdom. And you have now have the authority to bind on earth anything that is bound in heaven and loose on earth anything that is loosed in heaven which means we've got to go to heaven before we die you cannot reproduce something you have never seen and God is inviting us to live from heaven to earth that's why he didn't kill us that's why he wants to completely transform us Jesus said, unless you be converted and become as a child, you'll not see the kingdom of heaven. In other words, we need to change the way we're thinking from this adult mindset that thinks it has everything figured out back to the awe and wonder of a child who asks, Daddy, why is the sky blue? 
Mommy, why? Mommy, why? Mommy, why? Mommy, why? Any mommy in the house? You, how many whys? Well, I don't know what your mark is, but there's a mark out there that you finally say, go talk to your dad. And dad says, because. Yeah, he doesn't have any more. Here's the point. We have a father that has answers. Now, we may not understand it. Let me rephrase that. We won't understand it, but merely have to obey. But we've got to hear what he's saying. Not just what he has said. I, I love the book. I love the Bible. It has transformed my life. It, it's, it's alive it's still alive today. But I've discovered in my relationship with the Lord, sometimes he's saying something today that he didn't say yesterday. That he's not, I'm sorry. That he's not saying the same thing he said yesterday. He's got a new word today. Now, it won't contradict what he has said, but it's fresh for today. And, and the word that we need for the chaos in our world, I don't think, Many have heard it yet because we're still fighting with weapons that to destroy flesh and blood enemies. I want us to take a, a moment. I, I want you to close your eyes. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit is hovering on the, over the chaos right now. And, and I want to take some minutes, and, and I want you to hear, hear what Papa is saying. I even think the reason Arden is crying like that is in her spirit. She's feeling what the, what the Father's feeling over the world right now. I think he probably is crying. I think there's an excitement and a peace in his cry. But like Jesus that looked at Israel looked at Jerusalem and began to weep because they looked like they were sheep without a shepherd. I think the world is being looked at by Father God and these tears are falling because we have people who are shepherdless sheep. And, and that's not just the lost. It's many of the, the found, those that have been saved because they've chosen to go after a different shepherd. You see, when I seek knowledge rather than relationship with the Lord, I can gain earthly knowledge. But that knowledge normally puffs up. I love the verse in Mark that said, where Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and said, you're, all, you're also worried about the words that I'm speaking. The words that I'm speaking are not mine. They're my father's. And that really is irritating to you because it's different than what you're saying. But he who is willing to obey my words will know that what I am saying is the word of the father and is true. He who is willing to obey will know. You see, we've got it backwards. We've been seeking knowledge and not obeying. We've been waiting to obey until we understand and have knowledge. And even in this chaotic place, we're, we're trying to figure out how can we convince people that what we're thinking is the truth. And even if you were to present a knowledge that would convince many, you would never change the culture because it's from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I just happen to believe that we're allergic to that fruit and go into spiritual anaphylaxis when we eat it. We were never equipped to eat that fruit. Our body, our soul, and our spirit have never been equipped to digest that fruit. We were meant to live in relationship. But we chose the enemy to feed us. And even the church today in many places in the world, are eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and forming new Old Testaments to live by rather than eating from the tree of life. So here's the question for you. Can you connect up with God right now? 
In fact, I, the reason I'm having you close your eyes is I want you to focus on Him. And, and, and I want you to press into Him right now. Turn your affection toward Him. Turn your attention toward Him. And tell Him something you're thankful for. I'm, I'm thankful for this church. I'm, I'm thankful for Mike inviting me. I'm thankful for Nate and the other elders that have been leading this house. And, and for Tony that pastors the people. I'm thankful. I'm thankful for this, the history of this house because you guys have stuck in there. You've refused to release your corner of the garden. It's just time. It's just time for you to take dominion and increase. I'm thankful for my daughter who travels with me and I'm thankful for my son and daughter Michael and Delena who are pouring into the youth of this house and, and, and our house, our family. I'm thankful that I didn't come from my church to this church. It's not my church. I'm thankful that Summit is Jesus' church. To your church, this isn't your church, this is Jesus' church. In fact, you are Jesus' church. <clears throat> I'm thankful, Lord. So right now, Holy Spirit, would you tell us the word that you want us to speak into chaos. Now, if you're having difficulty hearing that, just ask Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, is there a lie I'm believing? And, and if you heard a yes, then say, Holy Spirit, who do I need to forgive? And, and then I just, let's just all pray this together. Holy Spirit, I forgive that person for the harm they did to me. And I renounce the lie, Holy Spirit, that you would ever do that to me. Now, Holy Spirit wants the truth. Now, take note of that truth. and Now, ask, Father God, what is the word you want spoken into this chaos? I guarantee you it won't be a hate-filled, condemning word. It's going to be a life-filled word. Because while there is a judgment day coming, today is not it. I do not believe the prophets that are saying, this is the judgment of God on the world. I, I don't believe that. I believe this is a lack of a kingdom son or daughter not speaking the word into it that God is saying. And here's what I want us to do. Is this microphone on? I'd like for it to be turned on, Nate. Thank you. And I want you to come up and speak over the microphone because I want it recorded. What is the word that God gave you? And we're going to pray into those words. I'm now waiting on you. God's looking for co-laborers. <clears throat> Just line up. Be still and know that I am God. So, Papa, we just ask you to give us a revelation that you are God. You are in charge. Lament. God, we join with your lamentation over the situation and culture of this world right now. We join in allowing the tears to fall, but we refuse to be discouraged as we know you're not. And we weep for the night, but joy comes in the morning. So I got the word bonanza, which is very strange because I... Other than an old TV show, I didn't have any idea what that, well, I didn't know what the <laughs> word meant. And so I had to look it up. And I didn't know we were going to do this. And so I, so I almost didn't, I almost said, I'm not going to say this word because it seems weird. But I just looked it up and it says, it's a noun, a definition is a situation or an event 
that creates a sudden increase in wealth, good fortune, oh. or profits. <laughs> dun, 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 Papa, we declare bonanza over the world. I w wait a minute, Mike. I want you to stay with me. I want you to read that. Uh, it's an event that causes what? A financial... A situation or an event that creates a sudden increase in wealth, good yeah. fortune, or profits. And so we declare an, an, an event that this is a moment of bonanza. And not only in our nation, but across the world. That people move into profit and gain and wealth, and they know it's because it's your kingdom. Amen. Amen. We declare the wealth of your kingdom expand now into Amen. this chaos. Amen. We speak into this chaos, bonanza. Bonanza. Love. It's always been love. Yeah, and Papa, right now, we release your perfect love into this chaos to dispel fear. For Lord, we know that love, your perfect love, casts out all fear. And Papa, I know that fear has gotten a foothold, and we declare it cannot grow in the garden ground any longer. And this whole earth is your garden, and we release love. And, and Lord, <clears throat> not just in word but indeed yes. Yes, Lord. love looks like something mm -hmm. so teach us how to love I, I, I'm gonna put us on pause here for just a second because Papa Jack Taylor my papa in the faith said one day he was walking through the woods of North Carolina and uh, he was had been meditating on the verse that we love because he first loved us and he's, he was meditating on he said you know Lord I I have to tell you, I, I love you. I do love you. But I have to tell you, on my best days, I'm probably, probably getting a B, maybe a B plus. And the Lord says, Jack, do you think I want your love? And Jack says, well, yeah, I, I do. And he goes, I don't want your love. He said, your love, at best, is conditional and wishy-washy. It's not to be trusted. It's of no value. Your love... I don't want your love. That's why I shed my love abroad in your heart. I want you to take the love I've given you and give it back to me. Because then my love has accomplished what I sent it to do. Here's the thing. Love looks like something. Love is shed abroad in our hearts for the purpose of releasing it into our world. Because perfect love casts out fear. So, Papa, help us to blow the dam on your love. That, that love that we so cherish. Blow the dam on it so that it cannot stay within us, but that it flows in every direction from us. So much so that the lost come running to grab a hold of us to say, what must I do to be like you? Yeah, Jody. Life everlasting. Papa, we release life everlasting into this world today. That they would turn their eyes from temporary, worthless things onto the eternal things of life. Peace. Peace I give to you. <clears throat> and that peace is a peace that is beyond our understanding, Lord. So we give up. I you respond with something let me know you're alive and and uh, so we give up our right to understand so that we can enter into the peace that passes understanding and would you grace the world with the ability to release that right to understand in fact deliver us from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil yes. And help us to deliver others from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to attach to the tree of life Hallelujah. in Jesus' name. Wow. He said this all week for me. He said, Michael, you're a child of God, not a child of circumstance. That's good. So, Lord, we declare we will be moved by our Father. Yes. We will release to them fatherhood. That we would come, we just... We come against the orphanhood that circumstance has yes. produced. Yes. 
this fatherless planet, this orphaned planet that has produced m multiple uh, millennia upon millennia of orphans, we say come home to Papa yes. and be adopted. Yes. Obedience and relationship. Papa, we declare we will obey everything you say to the place that we only say what you're saying and we only do what you're doing. Go ahead. The word I heard was peace. <clears throat> Amen. Can't have too much of that. That's right. Lord, Amen. we just... We can say it twice. Yeah. And, and so, Lord, not only do we want to give up our right to understand, to enter peace that passes understanding, but you, would you increase that peace, not just for us, but everyone we come in contact with. Lord, that when we look in the eyes of the people that are so overwhelmed by fear, that your love would flow, releasing them from fear, and that we would install peace as their normal. Rachel? I got love and also revival. Yeah. Revival, revival, revival. Whew. Rachel, I want you to pray. I want you to pray that revival. Release the fire, girl. Release the fire. Release the fire. Lord, I pray you bring revival. I pray that you would fall upon us. Let your rain sprinkle us. Soak us. I pray that your Holy Spirit would lead us to where you want us to go. Say what you'd have us say. Do what you'd have us do. I pray that you'd wake up the church. That the church would stand up. Speak the truth. And proclaim your love throughout the world. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, I heard... Why so downcast? <laughs> and, and I think the rest of that is put your trust in God for yeah. you'll yet praise him. Yeah. So, Papa, we take that downcast countenance and we lift our eyes. We lift our eyes and we place them, we focus them on the author and the finisher of our faith, yes. Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, this has been recorded, and I hope that you guys will write these things down because I think that what was said in those, those words are your assignment. These are your assignments. In fact, somebody needs to just put a prayer card together with those words on it, maybe even the prayers that were prayed, and get them out to this house so you can fulfill your assignment as not battling flesh and blood. And when you're tempted, pull the card out. And remind yourself, these are the weapons of our warfare. Last thing I want to say is this. <clears throat> At the end of the first day, evening gave way to morning. The first day. Evening gave way to morning. The second day. The third day. The fourth day. The fifth day. The sixth day, God created man. And evening gave way to morning. The sixth day. And on the seventh day, God rested from all his labor. God's last day of work was creating man. Man's first day with God was to learn rest. Amen. And there was never any scripture that said, an evening gave way to morning the seventh day. We do not war for rest. We war from rest. Because that rest God has never ceased resting. 
the Sabbath was made for man so that one out of seven days he would be able to rest this flesh and soul body. God made it that way. A day to take care of yourself. But God never left the Sabbath. Since the creation of the world and after the seventh day, there was no evening gave way to morning the seventh day. This is what the writer of Hebrews is talking about when it sa he says, there still remains a rest for the people of God. And God is inviting you back into that eternal Sabbath. Not a Sabbath without activity. In fact, productivity is required. But you will only produce when you're doing what God is doing and saying what God is saying. Everything else is formless and void. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.